Well, hello, everybody. Um, welcome to the Big Money Speaker Series. I'm going to just pause for a second. And we're going to we're going to let the uh, YouTube stream start, and I think that's going. So, um, trying to find my video. Okay, there it is. Awesome. Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Big Money Speaker Series. Um, this is a series of talks that happens um, generally the second Tuesday of every month, and we get different folks to come in and talk about uh, different aspects of the Missouri River, um, or sometimes broader topics that relate to our relationship with water um, and, and our big rivers. And, and today's talk is, is kind of along those lines. Um, we're gonna be taking a little broader look at some of the issues surrounding our connections to our big rivers. Um, before I get into that, I did want to uh, share a few things that are going on. So my name is Steve Shinar. I'm the director of Missouri River Relief. And we, we are a nonprofit based in Columbia, Missouri that works um, on connecting people to the Missouri River through really direct action, experiences, education, recreation. Um, and the Big Money Speaker Series is, is part of that. Um, hopefully sometime really soon, we'll be returning to Les Bourgeois Bistro where we've been hosting the series for um, over 10 years now, which is pretty exciting. Um, a few things that Missouri River Leaf has cooking, first of all, uh, 2021 is when we are going to be celebrating our 20th anniversary working on the Missouri River. So um, this October will be the 20th anniversary of the first Missouri River Relief cleanup, which was in Easley, Missouri in 2001. Um, and uh, there's a little note from one of the viewers who <laughs> is ready to go back to Roachport. She's tired of Zooming for the Big Money Speaker Series. I, I, mean, I hear you, I hear you. Um, and I feel like we're, we're getting close to that point. So, um, so yeah, our 20th anniversary. So um, pretty exciting work. Um, our operations manager, Kevin, is working on a program for this fall where we're going to be doing river cleanups from Kansas City to Columbia over the course of two months. Um, it's going to be called the Big Muddy Clean Sweep. This is actually the third Big Muddy Clean Sweep that we've done um, in different sort of parts of the Missouri River. So we're going to be hitting some really some remote stretches that um, we haven't hit before. So it's, that's exciting. Um, we're really excited to spend a lot of time on the river and hopefully a lot of you will be able to join us along the way to help out. Um, a little closer to now, next week, we are heading up to Omaha, Nebraska. So we're gonna be working um, May 20th through the 22nd with groups of volunteers in the downtown Omaha and Council Bluffs, Iowa reach of the river there. So we're actually gonna be camping downtown Council Bluffs. Um, so, you know, I know that we have people tuning in from all over and if there's anybody from up in that area I hope you can come join us, come visit us, come help clean up. Um, another program we've got coming up really soon in June is uh, brand new for us. Um, our education director, Kristen, has a young child and um, she just sort of has really woken up to um, this audience of, of parents with young kids and wanted to come up with a program that really like fit their needs, you know, and and gave them something that the uh, that they can tap into and that the kids can tap into. So she came up with a program called Mornings at the River. Um, this is going to be three weeks in June, every Tuesday and Thursday. Um, so it's June 8th and 10th, the 15th and 17th, the 22nd and the 24th. And each week will be a different theme. So you can basically pick you know, either the Tuesday or the Thursday, whichever worked for you. Um, and I don't have them right in front of me, but I know that one of the themes is about birds. So they're actually gonna have a, a falconer come and show off um, some of the birds that they work with and train and teach a little bit about um, uh, some of the birds that use the Missouri River too. Um, 
Another day is going to be art. So doing um, some collaborative murals with Wild Tea, um, which is pretty exciting. And um, and then one of the weeks is about music. And Violet von der Haar is going to come and play some music and get everyone involved in making a little music at the river. So these days are also going to involve um, plenty of free time where people can just um, walk down the Katy Trail. These are this is all at Cooper's Landing. So. Um, thank you to them for letting us take over their place for free. Um, find out more on our website, riverrelief.org. Um, you can learn uh, what Kristen's got cooking for the young ones. So these are th these programs are designed for kids zero to five, so really young ones. Um, but the real reason you came tonight was to hear um, the thoughts from our good friend, Dean Klinkenberg, who is... Um, We've met doing river stuff and um, at, at a variety of river events. And uh, Dean's been kind of obsessed with the river, for the, in, in particular, the Mississippi River um, for many years. And Dean has a really great website that is called Mississippi Valley Traveler. And it just is chock full of some of his cool thoughts, some of his cool writings, some great photographs. There's links to great river music. It's kind of a deep dive into the Mississippi River and Mississippi River culture. Now, Dean has also written a series of guidebooks about the Mississippi River. So traveling the river really from the land perspective, right? So following the Great River Road um, and some of the small towns and cool sites along the way. Um, he's also written uh, a series of mysteries um, the Frank Dodge mysteries, um, and the, and Frank Dodge is, you know, believe it or not, you know, they say, write what you know, right? So Frank Dodge is a travel writer, um, who travels along the Mississippi river and, and gets involved in, in shenanigans. So, um, uh, now Dean is also working. I asked him the other day, like what, what he's up to. And so Dean, Dean right now is working on at least three books. Um, I, I, Got a little lost in there, but I think he's working on another, wrapping up another Frank Dodge book. Um, he's working on a big book about the Mississippi River, uh, which is pretty exciting. And that's probably a couple of years down the road, um, a big broader thing uh, that he's working on. And, and I'm kind of blanking on the other one, but hopefully he'll fill us in on what he's up to. But um, Dean is joining us tonight because he's, um, he's also a thinker and he's been thinking about you know, some of the ways in which we live with our big rivers, and, and that's not just the Mississippi River, you know, the Missouri is certainly one of those, and there are many rivers that feed and connect, you know, our country together, and, um, and you know, as, as our world is changing, as we're changing our world, um, you know, we're, we're seeing impacts that we're doing to our rivers and those impacts are feeding back into the way that we live too. So um, Dean's kind of calling on, on all of us to, to take a new look at, um, at our relationship with our rivers and um, hopefully how we treat our rivers and the way we live with our rivers. So super excited to be joined by Dean and his, um, as soon as I shut up and he starts talking, his, his image will pop up too. So I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and shut up. Dean, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Well, thanks so much, Steve. And man, congratulations on 20 years. This, uh, that's a heck of an accomplishment. And I look forward to maybe being able to help you all celebrate some this summer. Uh, I think I speak for a lot of people that I know I'm anxious and perhaps a little restless and ready to be out uh, amongst people again and be... Uh, be able to experience some of these in-person events, particularly along the big rivers. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen as I chat a little bit. This all worked earlier. I'm sure it'll go fine now. Let's see, let's do that. Um, as Steve mentioned, I've had this, what some might consider a somewhat unhealthy obsession with the Mississippi for a while. and. Uh, that obsession does kind of extend to all of our big rivers, although most of my expertise is confined to the Mississippi, uh, thanks to 
uh, Steve and other folks uh, uh, along the Missouri River, I've been learning quite a bit more about problems there. And I think we, it suffers from a lot of the same issues. Uh, it's, um, you know, it's something that I've been thinking about. And uh, I had an opportunity to work with an organization called the Mississippi River Network to put together a new talk that I'm hoping we can use to help shift even a little bit um, the way we think about uh, how we manage our big rivers. So even though many of the examples that I'll show you tonight uh, might uh, reference the Mississippi specifically, um, all of these things would apply to, to any of our big rivers. So thanks to the Mississippi River Network, I'll thank them again at the end for uh, uh, participating or helping to, to make this possible. Um, let's go ahead and get going. And I do want to emphasize also that, you know, I'm really curious to get your feedback when we get to the end. At any point, I know you can drop a question in the Q&A box and uh, Steve will help uh, manage that later. But uh, anytime during the talk, if something comes up you're curious about, just go ahead and drop a, a question in that Q&A box and, and we'll get to as many as we can when we're done. I want to just kind of start by, um, showing some images of different things you might see along the, our big rivers on any given day. It's, you know, of course, uh, you're always going to see somebody who's out there fishing along the big river. Sometimes you see one of those uh, steamboat replicas pulling up, uh, carrying overnight passengers who are traveling into nostalgia. Uh, occasionally you're lucky and you get uh, uh, stared down upon by a hawk or maybe you get to chill out on a sailboat on some of the calmer portions of the rivers. Um, I love the opportunity to get lost in the huge sand, you know, sandy islands or sandbars along the big rivers. Sit back and watch you know, thousands of uh, flocks of waterfowl fly overhead, uh, or maybe just sit and try to figure out where the beaver is that constructed a structure like that. We've got people who still live on the river in, in some places, uh, fewer than there used to be, but there are still places where people live on the river. Certainly, we love to enjoy the river uh, in other ways, like going in for a good swim. There are plenty of festivals that celebrate where communities celebrate their connections to the river, their history with the river. Bike riding, you know, we've got bike trails now that line uh, many of our big rivers. Uh, great ways to, to experience uh, life along the river. And of course, you know, there are people like me that also like just getting out in a boat and paddling around under our own power. We, uh, we have places where, you know, the river has inspired um, a lot of music and it still inspires some people to sit along its banks and listen to people perform today. Uh, a great way to enjoy, uh, uh, it's not uncommon to see people out on the river uh, taking a, a little tour, a guided tour, uh, looking for wildlife or uh, learning a little bit about uh, the river system. There are people who work very hard to protect uh, the rivers. These are the uh, uh, water walkers, many of them, most of them from Minnesota. Um, rivers are often a place where we pay respects to those who have passed before us. We see the river shared by uh, people in various sized boats um, in different parts of the rivers. Sometimes people just you know, uh, corral their boats into a party cove. And sometimes we like to just stand by the river and look at it. Now, these are just a few of the snapshots. Um, what's instructive though, is that in spite of all that, we only really manage the river for two things, for flooding and for big boats. Occasionally, we also will manage it for recreation, but only when it doesn't interfere with those first two. Wendell Berry, you know, the great thinker Wendell Berry wrote uh, in uh, Solving for Pattern, a bad solution solves for a single purpose or goal, such as increased production. And it's typical of such, such solutions that they achieve stupendous increases in production at exorbitant biological and social costs. Well, essentially we've been solving for um, a single purpose solution along our big rivers. What's wrong with this? Well, our big rivers are far too complex for these single purpose solutions, just to prevent flooding or to maintain enough water for certain kinds of boats. 
these solutions are focused just on managing the amount of uh, the amount of water that we have in the river. Managing rivers solely for water levels has come at an enormous cost. Why? Well, let's take a step back. What exactly is a river? Well, I found this quote uh, from uh, a few years back from an engineer with the Mississippi River Flood Control Association about the Mississippi, that the Mississippi is first and foremost a drainage system for a large section of the country. So in the engineer's view, it's basically water and a gradient. So I guess that would qualify as a river under that definition. Of course, there's a lot more to a river than just drainage. Rivers are incredible recycling centers for organic matter, leaves, dead fish, animals uh, will fall into the water uh, and constantly be recycled. Uh, that material will be added to and removed from the river by various organisms in the river. Phytoplankton uh, play a key role in breaking down organic matter. It's a mix of things like algae and bacteria and mostly single-celled plants. And they're really at the base of the food chain. Those uh, phytoplankton we know produce half of the world's oxygen. And admittedly, most of that comes from plankton in the ocean, but uh, the uh, plankton in our rivers also contribute to that. Those phytoplankton are in turn favorite food for small organisms like zooplankton, invertebrates that include snails and crayfish and insect larvae. And those small organisms are favorite food for somewhat bigger organisms like small or young fish, but also for paddlefish and buffalo fish. These small fish are then consumed by larger fish, northern pike maybe, or walleye or bass. And those bigger fish are favorite foods for mammals like bear uh, and uh, even for us. Now, all of those um, organisms live in a very complex world, uh, a rich, a series of a uh, system of rich and diverse ecosystems that include forests, marshes and swamps and prairies. Those floodplain forests are dominated by hardwood trees like cottonwood, oak, elm, sycamore, etc. You know, I've, I found some studies that uh, suggested in the past those hickory trees in the floodplains probably produced upwards of 2,200 bushels of nuts per square mile. Uh, pecan trees could, were capable of producing up to 3,400 bushels of nuts per square mile. Now, that's a lot of nuts. And we also are pretty sure that indigenous people, well, we know that ind indigenous people harvested nuts and berries from these forests. But we're also pretty sure that they manage those forests to maximize nut and fruit production. In the, below the canopy, at the lower levels of, the, of those floodplain forests, there is a wide variety of plants that live there. Cardinal flowers, wood, wood nettles, woodbine, and of course everybody's favorite, poison ivy. Away from those floodplain forests, there's a mixture of wet and dry prairies that uh, uh, are part of the river's world, uh, dominated by waves of grasses. And again, these prairies for centuries were managed with regular burns, typically in the fall. Those marshes and swamps, you, know, you see a variety of plants there, probably you know, what we associate most would be things like lotuses and lilies. They also provide great way stations for migrating birds. Uh, spawning habitat for fish and they really they filter water and help keep it clean. You go a little further back and uh, you get uh, the bluffs and upland habitats uh, along both of you know the Mississippi and Missouri rivers there are long stretches where you have these gorgeous limestone and sandstone bluffs that were carved by meltwaters as the glaciers retreated. Um, along a lot of those bluffs you can find microhabitats. you know um, goat prairies are really common, um, little uh, dry, dry prairies on the tops of many bluffs. And then there's an ancient Ice Age era um, habitat called an algific talus slope that you can find in a few places. Those tend to be in protected areas uh, and uh, not always advertised, but uh, they do exist and they're throwbacks to 10,000 plus years ago. Because of all this, because of all those amazing ecosystems, the range of ecosystems, um, these big rivers create incredible diversity of, uh, and they create abundance. And these are two concepts I wanna talk just a little bit more about. What do we mean by diversity? Well, just along, you know, the big, just along the Mississippi system, 
Um, we know that it, there are at least 260 species of fish uh, that call the, the Mississippi and the Missouri rivers home. That represents about a quarter of all fish species in North America. And in, among those uh, 260 species are four very ancient species of fish that go back millions of years. Bowfin, sturgeon, paddlefish, alligator gar have managed to survive uh, quite a range of historic events uh, during their time on this planet. There are over 300 species of bird that migrate along the Mississippi River. That's again, a third of all bird species in North America rely on that corridor uh, at, one, at least you know, a couple times a year. There are mammals from tiny little shrews all the way up to black bear. Uh, we have canopy and understory trees, including many trees uh, such as cypress that can live for hundreds and hundreds of years. And of course, we've got all those insects that we all love to complain about. The other aspect though that we don't often think about is that this, these rich ecosystems create abundance. Um, the upper Mississippi, I'm sure this data would apply to other rivers as well. This is uh, uh, from one particular study that I found was extremely productive in the past. And the upper Mississippi was capable of supporting up to 700 pounds of fish per acre, a variety of species of fish. And just by comparison, you know, Minnesota is famous for the lakes, of, especially in Northern Minnesota, famous as fishing lakes. Uh, and people from all over the world travel there uh, to, to fish. Well, the upper Mississippi historically has been 35 times, has supported 35 times as much fish, -like, fish life uh, as the lakes of Northern Minnesota. We know that the Mississippi historically and the Missouri supported dozens of species of mussels. Uh, at one time they formed thick embankments in uh, different parts of the river. And of course, flocks of birds thick enough to darken the sky. Uh, when John J. Audubon traveled along the Mississippi, at one point he wrote in his journal that he witnessed the passage of millions of gold, millions of golden plovers coming from the Northeast and going nearly South. You, know, you read historic uh, journals from people and you, you get these accounts where you know, at times the sky darkened from flocks of passenger pigeons uh, and, and other birds were so thick uh, that uh, they were, you know, they can literally shoot them out of the sky by the dozens or hundreds with no effort. Uh, they were very abundant. But be so because of this focus uh, on managing the water alone, what we've done is we've undervalued the complexity that's uh, inherent in these rivers. And we set goals, therefore, that are way too narrow for river management. We, we essentially end up asking the wrong questions and getting the wrong answers. So because of that, we get things like this, you know, where uh, depending upon where you are in the river, uh, you see more or less of the river's historic floodplain that's intact. Uh, from the Twin Cities to the Quad Cities uh, along the Mississippi, most of that uh, floodplain still is connected to the main channel of the river. Part of that is because there's National Wildlife Refuge through there that uh, helped protect those, those areas. And part of it's because the valley is not always especially wide, so it wasn't always practical to levy it off. But you get south of the Quad Cities to St. Louis and only about half of the floodplains remain uh, connected to the main channel. South of St. Louis, it's only 20%. And then you get down below Cairo and the entire lower Mississippi is walled in by levees. So we've gone from this to this. And you know, I know there are some people who would look at that and think that's an amazing and great thing. That's a sign of progress. Uh, and we can, you know, we could talk about that later. Uh, it's a mixed bag for me. Now, because of this, you know, we're altering the river in ways that's taken us a little time to understand. Um, we know we're getting higher and higher flood crests now. Just in St. Louis, four of the 10 highest crests on record have happened in the past decade. Uh, we know that there are floodplain forests that are collapsing uh, in some parts uh, along our big rivers. We've seen those diverse prairies plowed and heavily fertilized for single crops. And now because those 
uh, agricultural fields for corn in particular, but soybeans as well, rely so heavily on fertilizer, much of that fertilizer is running off into the rivers and polluting them. And that's one of the factors, it's the main factor in creating the dead zone at the Gulf of Mexico every year. But we're also seeing the rivers are losing their capacity to support wildlife. I think mostly what we're seeing so far is a loss of abundance along the Mississippi there hasn't really been much species loss at this point, but at least half of mussel species along the Mississippi at this point are endangered, uh, and some of them will probably be lost in the near future. So what are some different goals that maybe we could solve for instead of just trying to manage water? Well, I'm gonna throw out some ideas that I don't think are gonna be especially controversial, and I can't see your faces, so I don't know if you're shocked or not. You're probably not gonna be. Um, but there are three things that I want to talk about. I want to talk about managing for a healthy river, for a resilient river, and what it means or what it could mean uh, to manage big rivers sustainably. These are all ideas we hear a lot about, but what, what might these actually look like in practice? Well, let's talk about a healthy river. Healthy rivers are healthy systems. That's my starting place for this. A healthy river is defined by the interactions between all of its parts. Uh, healthy rivers have intact connections between all of those various parts. It's really critical because animals rely on different parts of those uh, systems uh, at different times of year. Um, and I'll come back to that in just a minute, but you know, all, of the, all of those parts of the system contribute to the greater whole. I, I remember reading uh, or last year when I was reading about uh, uh, American Indian history, I was reading a little bit more about the community that lived at Poverty Point in Louisiana. Um, it's one of the oldest mound groups um, that we know of. Uh, it goes back, uh, oh, I'm gonna screw this up probably, but about 3000 years or so, uh, those mounds were built 3000 years ago. And at the North America at that time was, was uh, the, the natural world was such that if you were one of the people who lived around Poverty Point, you could get in a boat, a canoe, and you could travel from Northeast Louisiana to the Washita Mountains in Arkansas, to the Ozark Mountains in Missouri, to the Shawnee Hills in Southern Illinois, and many other places, all without ever leaving a boat. All of those waterways were connected. And it was possible for people to move about vast distances by boat um, uh, through the, using all those systems. That's connectivity. Of course, you can't have a healthy river without a healthy watershed. And when we talk, think about the watershed, we're talking about a much bigger area. Uh, uh, some people essentially say, you know, the, the, the river itself is, is basically the canary in the coal mine for the health of the watershed as a whole. So some of the signs maybe that we could point to for what might indicate a healthy river would be things like the diversity of species supported, are those species abundant enough to sustain themselves? Um, we know that uh, these uh, that a healthy river is typically better able to fend off invasive species. In fact, there's some evidence now that perhaps the invasion of bighead and silver carp uh, is uh, the, the degree to which that has happened is probably in part uh, because the rivers where they have taken root so abundantly were degraded to begin with the Illinois River in particular. Uh, so in, you know, a healthy river helps fend, probably protects against, to some degree, against invasive species taking over. Uh, and then we also know that uh, we have to monitor the quality of the water in the whole system. What about a resilient river? What does this mean? Well, you know, resilience is one of those words we hear a lot in, uh, in pop culture now. And I wanna talk about it in a couple other contexts first, and then we're gonna come back around to what it might mean for a river. You know, for people, you know, my background was in psychology. I'm kind of uh, familiar with the basic term. I've always thought about resilience for people, uh, meaning essentially that you develop the coping skills to deal with life's up and downs. Uh, and then uh, maybe another component of that is that you gain the confidence in your ability to use those coping skills when you need them. To me, that's the core of resilience. Resilience has become a popular concept in uh, urban planning circles as well. Uh, 
basically, you know, referencing a built environment that can be adapted to changing economies and trends. So uh, you might get a, store, a storefront that uh, uh, some point down the road becomes a restaurant, uh, maybe a shoe factory that's converted to lofts. That's, uh, those are a couple of ways that you might think about resilience in an urban context. Um, and I'm sure that you know, there are folks who can explain that better, but those are a couple, just a taste of what that's like. For rivers, you know, it seems like you know, the idea of resilience really comes down to uh, the ability of rivers to adapt while maintaining that complexity in their essence. Uh, their ability to bounce back and recover uh, after major threats or you know, after a big storm or uh, the ability to heal and put itself back together. It's hard to do that you know, without redundancy. You know, rivers often have um, built-in redundancy in, in multiple ways. Uh, that's another way that helps preserve their resilience and their ability to bounce back. And then again, that connectivity uh, helps uh, promote resilience as well. But we can't get past the basic fact, I think, that healthy and resilient rivers are at their core dynamic. And this is maybe one of the fundamental problems we have to find a way to reconcile ourselves to, is that rivers are dynamic and it's not a convenient thing for us. Uh, with seasonal flooding, you know, and when rivers rise, uh, as they do naturally, that water spills over into the floodplain and life will circulate around a much wider area where that water touches. Fish will use those backwater areas uh, to reproduce. Uh, the river will drop nutrients that replenish the soil and, uh, per, you know, and feed plant life. Uh, and then what much of that water in places will filter uh, through their wetlands and underground aquifers. All of that is important in the bigger cycle. But it's not just high water that is important. You know, low water matters too. Rivers have to be uh, allowed to drop for the systems to, you know, the complex systems to be complete. There are some plants that only grow after the water goes down. Um, and those pools of water that left behind as the water uh, recedes, you know, end up nourishing a lot of uh, land animals. Right now, we're, uh, we basically have created artificially, continuously high levels of water in many parts of the big rivers because of the dams that we've built. And those artificial high, you know, continuously high water levels have killed a lot of plant communities and eroded islands. They're especially noticeable behind the navigation dams on the upper Mississippi, where the closer you get to the navigation dam, the more open water you see um, as islands that used to be there have washed away. So the rivers are dynamic in multiple ways. It's not just water going up and down. Uh, but uh, within the river system, you know, we can't forget that there's water that's moving in some places. In some places, it's moving very fast. In some places, it's moving slower. And there are parts of the river where the water is not moving at all. All of that has implications for what life exists uh, in, in that part of the river. And water temperatures vary. You know, there's a, often a difference in the temperature between the main channel and the backwaters, depending upon the depth of the river. Uh, and of course, you know, between the upper and the lower river. So you know, all of that has implications for the kind of life that's supported there and it contributes to the diversity and abundance of life along the rivers. The floodplains, you know, the areas along rivers are just amazing examples of a world that's adapted to living with change. Uh, and one of, the, you know, one of the signature examples of this are silver, silver maple trees. Uh, silver maples can live with wet feet for quite a while. They can live during, you know, they can do just fine during periods when the water is high, uh, as long as it's not too high for too long. Uh, and they can do fine when the, when the land around them dries out. Uh, seedlings for silver maples can wait for years uh, before uh, the right conditions are there for them to sprout and grow. And beavers find them quite tasty, I'm told. So <clears throat> I'm kind of, I'm pretty realistic about a lot of things. I, I believe there's plenty of evidence that human beings have managed the natural world almost as long as we've been around. Uh, so I'm not saying we should never manage anything with a natural world and we should never try to manage rivers. 
but I think we need to think differently about what that means. And we need to think seriously about what kinds of management practices we can really sustain. So what might sustainably managed rivers look like? What are some of the things we should be thinking about? Well, you know, one uh, criteria we should be taking a hard look at is how much ongoing effort is required to do it. There are parts along the upper Mississippi where the, they have experimented with using drawdowns to try to mimic some of the natural flood and, uh, and dry periods along the river. So, you know, the, uh, the core will bring the water level down behind the navigation dams and allow some areas to dry out a little bit that in the past hadn't been allowed to dry out after those dams were built. So it's, uh, it's met with some success, but the problem with this approach, of course, is that you have to do it regularly. Human beings have to manually then uh, use the dams to lower the water levels and then bring them back up. Uh, probably this would have to be done every year. So there's a, it's a hands-on management approach. And the other limitation with this is given our current um, management regulations and the, the laws were around navigation, you can't do this if dropping it, if dropping water levels are gonna impact navigation. So if you've got some a semi-low water uh, year or a dry year along the Mississippi, uh, you can't artificially bring that down anymore if it's gonna risk uh, in, uh, slowing down or stopping bulk shipping. Uh, we also have, you know, when we take, think about uh, sustainability a lot of managing these big rivers, you know, we, we have the challenge that these are, are rivers that carry a lot of sediment. And, you know, the folks, those of you who live along the Missouri River, of course, I don't have to, uh, I'm preaching to the choir about this. When we build dams, though, we trap sediment behind those dams. Um, and we end up just sort of moving the sediment around in different ways. Um, so I know that uh, along the Mississippi to maintain the shipping uh, channel, uh, the core has to dredge as much as 20% of the uh, navigation channel every year. That's a lot of effort. You know, that's a huge amount of effort and it's expensive to do. Uh, and the core uh, can only do dredging in places where navigation is the direct beneficiary. If uh, navigation dams change the flow of the river and end up setting a bunch of settlement to um, a private marina, um, technically the core is not allowed to dredge uh, for you know, to provide relief to that marina. Uh, they can only do it for uh, for commercial navigation. Sometimes they have workarounds for that, but, um, and I, I think they can also sometimes dredge for um, habitat reasons, but that, uh, again, it's something that can't impact navigation. Dredging is an expensive deal. You know, um, after heavy flooding in 2018, uh, the Corps got an emergency appropriation of $200 million uh, just to dredge at the mouth of the river uh, at the Gulf of Mexico uh, to maintain what was then the 45 foot channel uh, to the Gulf. $200 million appropriation for one round of dredging. The other problem of course with all this dredging is you've got to do something with the material that you're sucking out of the bottom of the river. Uh, and there are parts of the Mississippi now where the core is really running out of places to put it. Uh, they had a huge kerfuffle a couple of years ago uh, around Wabashaw, Minnesota when they announced that they were going to buy uh, uh, productive farmland uh, along the Mississippi and turn it into a place to dump dredge spoil uh, because they had, didn't think they had any other place to put it and it was the cheapest alternative that they had available to them. They got a lot of pushback for that and came up with a different plan, um, but it doesn't change the fact that when you dredge, you're pulling up sand and silt that has to go somewhere. And in some cases they're reusing it to uh, rebuild islands. Some of it uh, they're going to be tapping into at the Gulf to try to rebuild lost coastal wetlands. Uh, but that's also another expense. You know, that's another thing that costs more money to, to use that uh, uh, to, to rebuild. And we can't ignore, you know, what we spend for these things. Uh, I know we don't think about it this way, but you know, infrastructure is not an asset. Infrastructure is a liability. Uh, 
when we build infrastructure, we're creating something that has long-term costs for maintenance and repair that did not exist before. Uh, that's a liability. Uh, and, you know, when you, uh, uh, um, that lost my train of thought on that one anyway, but uh, for me, I mean, that's the thing that a lot of us fail to understand about infrastructure. Like, um, and I think we, we often don't know how to go about judging uh, the real value of investing in, in different kinds of infra infrastructure. And I think we need to get a lot better at that. Uh, so this is probably a little bit of place. I might end up moving this point to the last uh, slide, but back to the dredging again. Uh, we have a, a, a navigation channel uh, that is congressionally authorized and uh, recently was approved to deepen it to 50 feet at the Gulf of Mexico. So it's gonna be 50 feet from the Gulf of Mexico up to Baton Rouge. And, and they believe they're gonna have deeper draft boats because of the expansion of the Panama Canal. So uh, they're adding another five feet depth to the navigation channel along that part of the river. Uh, well, that's gonna incur a huge liability to, to dredge every single year. The Corps got $85 million to dredge just in the first year of this project to deepen the channel. And that's gonna take, I believe, three years to get that done. So they're gonna spend you know, two to three hundred million dollars just to deepen the channel uh, five feet, and they're going to have to then maintain that fifty-foot channel with regular dredging. So they're incurring a new liability, uh, a new ongoing expense. There are projects where you know we're trying to rebuild islands that have been lost along the river, and this is great. You know, uh, uh, it's uh, it's one way to to try to reclaim some of the habitat loss. But it's another expensive proposition. Uh, just one project uh, up in Iowa uh, called Capole Slough, uh, restoring a 49, you know, 49 acres of islands cost $10 million. Now you multiply that many times over to rebuild the islands that have been lost uh, because of the way we manage the river today. And you can see how quickly those numbers escalate. And how do we pay for all this? Yeah. Uh, uh, I'm not a, a deficit hawk kind of person, but I do think, you know, if you, uh, when you have a dedicated source of revenue for projects like this, that makes them more sustainable over the long haul. Uh, and right now for most of what we do in managing rivers, there really is not a dedicated source of money. It comes from general revenues appropriated by Congress and sometimes supplemented with funds from state, uh, state governments. Uh, but there's not a revenue source that feeds into that, that is dedicated to those kinds of projects. Uh, the uh, shipping industry pays a diesel fuel tax, uh, uh, 20 cents a gallon, uh, but I've heard that there's legislation where they may be kicking it down to 10 cents a gallon again. That money though, can only be used for new navigation structures or significant rehabilitation of old structures. And from what I've been able to determine, at least along the Mississippi, the money generated from the diesel fuel tax covers barely 10% of the total cost uh, of uh, building, operating and maintaining the navigation systems on the Mississippi. So that's not a system with a dedicated revenue source that's paying for those systems. Essentially what we've been doing is, you know, because we've got these rivers that are inherently dynamic, we're basically freezing rivers at one point in time with all the, with all the structures to manage water. Um, and then when we notice we're having some undesirable uh, ecosystem consequences, we go in and we try these piecemeal approaches to put things back together. Let's build an island here. Let's you know, uh, reintroduce some species here. Uh, let's do a drawdown and occasionally and see what happens. Um, is this really a sustainable approach to maintaining a system that is so inherently complex? Hypothetical question. So how do we solve for complex goals? If we go back to the original quote, you know, that Wendell Berry idea, thinking about complex goals, what are we trying to do here? Well, economic goals are important. Uh, we can't dismiss that. But when we think about the economic benefits of our big rivers, these are the kinds of images most people think of. In fact, you know, there was a survey a few years ago, uh, uh, the general public was asked what they think of most when they think of the Mississippi. 
And almost half of the people, by you know, uh, almost half of the respondents um, said barges. That's the first thing uh, that they thought of. And it was by far and away uh, the winner for most common uh, characteristic uh, they thought of when they thought of the Mississippi. Not even Mark Twain, you know, or whirlpools or anything like that. Um, I think we have to find a better way to, to think about the economic impact uh, of our big rivers, though. Uh, these navigation structures that we've created have been great for shipping, um, and they have essentially, you know, they've significantly reduced risks to, for shipping products on big rivers, but they're paid for with public money. And as I said, you know, those private companies um, have very little skin in the game. They're not investing much of their own money in the structures that make shipping possible. I know they have equipment expenses and they're spending money on, you know, on their barges and on fuel and all that, but the structures that make that shipping possible uh, in the first place uh, are almost entirely paid for by you and me. Um, I'm not really sure that's a great way to operate a system like that. And, you know, it wasn't the, always that way. You know, the lock and dam system on the Mississippi wasn't built until the early 1930s. And it was a bit of an accident of history. Uh, uh, really, I think the uh, uh, deciding factor in finally getting built after years of uh, agricultural interests advocating for it uh, was the depression. And it was a, ended up being another public works program to get people back to work. Uh, if it hadn't been for that, probably they would not have been built. And the reason for that is I think there was some understanding that maybe it's not really that great an investment when you think about it. Uh, prior to the 1930s, uh, the risk of taking a boat out on the big rivers belonged to the person who owned the boat. There was no expectation that we were going to remake an entire river to remove the risk for one segment of people who use the river. But that's essentially what we do now. So because of this system, we have you know, uh, people who use the bulk shipping on the Mississippi, which the primary benefit are agribusinesses. They end up with artificially cheap shipping because of taxpayers, uh, because those navigation structures are paid for out of public dollars, they're subsidized. Uh, so this is a system of transportation uh, where the rates are artificially lower than they would be if this was all paid for by uh, market interests. So we need to think beyond those very specific economic benefits of moving bulk products, uh, moving corn and soybeans. Um, the current, um, our current cost, cost benefit formulas tend to focus on very um, singular goals. And mass production of corn that we ship to international markets is only one possible economic activity along big rivers. Uh, other economic benefits could include, and maybe you'll have additions you can, you can uh, throw out there, but other economic benefits from big rivers include recreation, include clean water. Uh, millions of people rely on the two rivers for their drinking water. Uh, water storage and wetlands reduces flooding. Uh, of course, it supports that abundant and diverse wildlife, but big rivers also play a role in uh, promoting human health and wellness. And it's harder to define a dollar value for that, but we can't dismiss the importance of that. On the environmental side, we've talked a little bit about you know, healthy and resilient rivers and uh, why those goals are important. But you know, we should think a little bit also about the spiritual aspects of our big rivers. Uh, it's a, uh, very important for many of us, you know, an important spiritual symbol or spiritual experience to be along the big rivers. Barry Lopez put it uh, extremely well, as he always did, that to put your hands in a river is to feel the cords that bind the earth together. Putting your hands in a river helps you feel connected to the world um, in a way that you couldn't otherwise. Uh, and a lot of people feel that way about our big rivers, and that's an important uh, aspect of our big rivers that we need to advocate for. Any you know, throughout the rivers, you know, these are scenes from along the Mississippi. But you go along our big rivers. Uh, there's a there's a good reason that there are so many sites uh, that are uh, sites of spiritual or religious worship. 
you know, to this day, we still have baptisms that happen in the Mississippi. You know, there are ancient mounds uh, and, and uh, spiritual sites along the Mississippi that go back thousands of years. And even today, we still build cathedrals next to the river or overlooking the river. You know, water is essential for life. You know, it's, a, it's essential for life, not just uh, in a physical sense that that water is actually uh, mandatory for us to continue to exist, but it's, you know, that symbolism of that water is very meaningful to many people. It's a symbol that connects our past and future uh, and connects us to something greater than ourselves, perhaps through baptism and rebirth. Uh, for some people, rivers represent a, a portal to another, another world. Uh, and of course, those rivers represent life itself. My soul has grown deep like the rivers, Langston Hughes. Rivers, uh, to put it succinctly, move us. Uh, they move us deeply. Drainage systems do not. And the other aspect of this that's really important, I think, is that um, the mental health benefits. Um, yeah, it's taken us a while to get a complete uh, understanding of all this. And I think we're still investigating many of this. We know that there are, are mental health benefits from being in nature, and we know that there are mental that there are mental health benefits from being around water. And rivers are, are an important part of that. Uh, when I was in college, uh, back when I was much moodier than I am today, I used to go down to the Mississippi River from my apartment in La Crosse, Wisconsin, and I'd find a place to sit, uh, to look at the water, to look at the wildlife, and to think about what was going on in my own life. Being next to the river was calming. Um, and there's a lot of reason, there, there's fairly recent research that shows that this is a common experience for many of us. Rivers are good for our mental health because they help calm us. They provide an increased sense of well-being. They force us to slow down, to pay attention to more, what, what, or to pay attention to more what's going on around us. They help us feel connected to something beyond ourselves. Um, and in some of us, they provide a sense of gratitude for being able to experience part of that amazing world. These are all things we cannot or should not easily dismiss, and we should resist temptations to quantify them strictly in terms of dollars. This inspires us, this calms us, uh, this provides sense of connection, this does not. So let's go back to that initial definition of a river. How, how do we, the, this idea of what a river is? Well, it's a complex system of connected parts. Uh, it is an important source of economic activity. It's a sacred place full of life. It's the essence, and its essence is the interaction between all of these parts. So if we go back to that engineer's perspective, the Mississippi is first and foremost a drainage system for a large section of the country. Uh, maybe you know, I'll take a, a stab at reframing that, that the Mississippi is first and foremost a complex system that supports life that is diverse and abundant. And I, if you have ideas for improving that definition, I welcome them. When we think about it in those terms, that river is a complex system, we can't help but think about managing uh, a complex system then and not just water. We need new goals for river management that account for the whole system and get over this focus on whether there's too much or not enough water. We have to keep the river healthy. We have to preserve its fundamental resilience, offer solutions that we can manage sustainably, that meet our economic and spiritual needs and that provide equitable access for everyone. Those are some of the goals I think we need to be embracing more than just worrying about floods and navigation. How do we get there? Well, that takes a whole nother day to figure out or more. No. Well, there are a few things that we, we do need to keep in mind. Uh, and I think fundamentally we have to accept the idea that the river is too complex to turn over to engineers whose only charge is managing the amount of water in it. We need decision makers with power who understand rivers as systems and who will represent all that complexity when they make policy. They need to respect river health, river resilience, spiritual and mental health benefits. I've got to finish with a, a quote um, 
Our, uh, our engineering capabilities are nearly limitless. Our economic views are too insensitive to be the only criteria for judging the health of the river organism. What is needed is a gentler basis for perceiving the effects of our engineering capabilities. This more humble view of our relation to the hydrologic system requires a modicum of reverence for rivers. That's from Luna Leopold, uh, the son of Aldo Leopold. Uh, he gave that in a speech in 1977. A reverence for rivers. Um, that's something we need to get in touch with, I think. We need to get back to feeling on a, an emotional level, a connection to these big rivers. Well, I kind of raced through that a little bit. Uh, it's a little, uh, uh, I brought them your questions and comments. I just want to thank again, the Mississippi River Network for helping uh, to uh, partner with me on this presentation. And I want to thank the uh, scientists and experts I met with uh, who helped uh, me formulate my, or put together my thoughts on this. Rosalind Lapierre, Jeff Hauser, Braxton Barden, and Ken Lubinsky. Uh, so, uh, oh, those are some of my books. Steve uh, mentioned that earlier. And thank you all for your patience and for uh, sitting there and listening to this on the other side of the void. And uh, Steve, I, let's see, we have some questions. Um, right now, we don't have any questions. Mary Kate um, from Columbia just wanted to say thank you for this wonderful presentation and for going to bat for our rivers, so vital to all beings' well being. Um, Thank you. And people are, are kind of chiming in there. Um, a great review and enlightening, you know. Um, I guess while we're waiting for a few questions to roll in, Dean, um, you know, this past week I've been thinking a lot about the Mississippi River, and I love how this presentation just uses the spirit of, and, and the way we have all connected with the Mississippi to sort of frame the story, you know, um, because there's so much, there's so much there. Um, and I've been thinking about the Mississippi a lot because uh, there, right now there are two different paddling groups that are paddling the entire Mississippi River um, trying to set speed records. So it just so happens that um, one group just finished last week and they paddled from Lake Itasca in Minnesota all the way you know, through Minnesota, Wisconsin, Iowa, Illinois, um, all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico in 17 days and 20 hours, um, which did set the world record for that, at least the, the world recorded record. Um, and there's another group right now who's doing it. And I've got a bunch of friends involved in that, including one of them that's paddling in the boat, Perry Whitaker, um, but some other folks on the support team. Um, and so right now, you know, they're they're up in in Iowa, Illinois, uh, working their way down. Um, and next week, a solo woman is going to do the same thing and attempt to hit the solo record. And so that's Tracy Lynn Martin. Um, so anybody can follow these folks, the, the group right now is Mississippi Speed Record. And it's really cool because you just, you see the river grow as they're paddling down very quickly, you know, um, and really get a quick tour of the actual real, you know, riverscape that they're paddling through, which is the stories that you've been talking about. So um, I definitely recommend you got, we've got some links on the Missouri River Leaf Facebook page. You can um, find out all about the, the groups that are doing that. Um, well, one thing I was wondering, Dean, um, well, let me, let me make sure I don't, I don't miss anything. So here's a good question. Um, well, I, I should make a point, you know, that, um, it's important. Like there's one thing that all of us can do that's super easy, which is just become a river citizen of the Mississippi River Network, right? Um, that program is called One Mississippi. And uh, it looks like somebody has shared that in the links, um, the link to join the river citizens. So basically then you'll start getting more information about how you can interact with the um, Mississippi River Network 
And do you have anything um, to say about your involvement with those folks, Dean, and uh, what it means to be a river citizen? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to make a quick plug for an, a major initiative we have coming up. But, you know, the Mississippi River Network has been around for 12 or 13 years. I forget exactly when this started. And it's a coalition of organizations that are interested in advocating for a healthy and resilient Mississippi. Uh, and it includes an amazing range of people from all the way from Minnesota down to, the Louis to Louisiana. It includes policy people. It includes people like me who are writers. Uh, it includes uh, uh, John Rusky from the Quapaw Canoe Company uh, and folks who are paddlers. So we represent a lot of different ways that people engage with the Mississippi. Um, so you know, we're gonna be doing uh, River Days of Action from June 10th to the 20th. Um, and if you sign up to be a river citizen, you can get alerts on what, the, what specific events are gonna be going on. Uh, we're working now on finishing up plans for a kickoff event in St. Louis on June 10th. Uh, if you like this presentation through Zoom, you'll love it when I get to do it in person at a beer hall. Uh, we're uh, probably gonna do this live uh, at the Schlafly Tap Room in downtown St. Louis. And we're gonna have some time to chat in person beforehand and network uh, and just kind of catch up and see each other in person. And then uh, maybe we'll even bump elbows or find some you know, safe way to uh, uh, exchange affection for each other. Um, so that'll be June 10th to June 20th. Uh, sign up to be River Citizen for uh, 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 notices on what's going on. But it, there's gonna be a lot going on. I know I'm on the board of the Mississippi River Water Trail Association. Uh, along, you know, Perry Whitaker, who uh, Steve mentioned is uh, one of our board members also. And our annual Paddle Fest is gonna be happening that weekend uh, on that Saturday, which is the 12th, I think. Um, it's gonna be a little different this year. Normally we use that as a way for people to get uh, introduced to different kinds of paddling boats. Um, and we just have the public come and show up and we put them in a kayak or a canoe and give them some guidance on how to paddle around. This year we have to do things a little bit more planned and I think have people sign up, but we're still gonna be doing uh, some of that. Uh, and I hope you can come and join us for it. Awesome, thank you, Dean. Um, so some more good questions and comments are kind of rolling in. And um, why Rocco has several of them. Um, I love this. Who are the river wanderers and where do we connect with some? <laughs> Well, I think the first place you go is the nearest riverbank. Uh, you, you're going to find some river wanderers at it just about along any riverbank, right, uh, Steve? That's been my experience. Yeah, that's right. You want to find river people, you do have to go to the river. They yeah. The place where they're found. <laughs> and, and you need to stick around. Like, you can't just drive by in a car at 50 miles an hour. You need to stop. And, you know, if you've got a kayak or a canoe or a way to get out on the water and paddle around a little bit, that's another good way to see who's out. So uh, that's a good place to start. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, if you ever have a chance to build a fire by, by a river, um, people are attracted to fires like moths, um, especially river wanderers. You know, they're particularly um, intrigued by a little campfire. Um, <laughs> I hear they also kind of like uh, river cleanups. Yeah, that's, that is true. Um, Man, we we have certainly met some interesting people um, just, you know, setting up camp for a river cleanup and just the people that end up being intrigued and interested or the people that just randomly happen to be paddling from Montana to Louisiana and happen to be passing by the day that we're camping there, you know, so you never know. <laughs> never know. Um, so this is from our friend Norm Miller up in Montana. And he's wondering, how do we not get depressed about our waters? Like maybe there is a shift in our human perspective about the importance of water. We had Standing Rock that promoted water is life. There's dam removals going on um, as American Rivers is tracking. Maybe more education about the rivers such as this presentation will help move this forward. After all, we're all, we're all connected by the river. Um, so that's kind of a lot, but you know that that kernel, that beginning question: How do we not get depressed about the water? Like, how do we shift that? 
uh, do you have another hour? Uh, right. <laughs> and maybe a couple of beers. Uh, you know, I, I do think there are some shifts that are happening. Uh, I, I think for me, as I think about it, part of the key is uh, continuing to find ways to get people to the rivers. We need, you know, more and more events that allow people to come and experience the rivers uh, on their own uh, or in groups. Uh, we need more stories about rivers uh, that go beyond, you know, the shipment of corn and soybeans. Uh, we need more public, you know, stories in the media uh, that describe people's connections to the rivers that tell a broader, give us a broader range of experiences out there. Um, we've kind of allowed the narrative to be taken from us. And I think maybe there was a period of time not all that long ago, we really didn't care about rivers too much. So I think there is a shift. I think we are coming back to understanding how important rivers are to us. Um, and you can see it in some communities that are spending a lot of money now to clean up their riverfronts and put parks and make it easier for people to, to get next to the river. It's happening in quite a few places on the, along the upper Mississippi and you know Memphis is doing a huge uh, remake of its uh, main riverfront park. Uh, so I, I think there is a sense that we have probably um, gone in the wrong direction for too long, but you know, we're uh, we're facing you know people that are well funded, that are making money from the current state of affairs, and we may not have the money uh, to counteract all the publicity that they can generate, but we can get people engaged with the river, and collectively, I think we can come up with a, a strong narrative about how our uh, how the bigger issues, the complexity, the diversity, and the abundance are uh, the issues that we really need to be managing for. Um, <clears throat> that's super, Dean. Uh, I, you know, I think that that um, trying to bring more stories to, to the equation is so important. Like the narrative is really powerful. Um, in the narratives that are out there, you know, um, and I feel like, you know, you and I, and, and just a whole bunch of us, and when I look at this list of people that are watching tonight, um, so many people that are doing that, creating stories and also creating ways for other people to create their own stories connected to rivers, you know, it's, um, that's kind of the thing. Um, Absolutely. I think that's really the main, the, the questions that have come in so far. Um, there is a question, how do we encourage the awareness of all this? And I mean, I feel like you've kind of addressed that, but I don't know if you have anything else to say about how, do, how we encourage, encourage awareness of these issues. Yeah, I think there, we have to think creatively about many different ways to, to make that happen. We can't get stuck in just one single approach. You know, I'm hoping during our River Days of Action, for example, that uh, we find many ways to, for people to connect with the river in ways that are meaningful to them personally. So maybe there are people who love to fish and they wanna bring their kids out to fish, um, coming up with events for them to do that. I know some people wanna paddle. Uh, we have wildlife photographers and hikers and uh, uh, we have people who just like to picnic next to the river and uh, we, uh, we need to come up with ways to make it easy for all those things to happen. Um, and then once they're there, we need to find ways to help engage them a little bit with understanding what we've done to the river and uh, to the rivers uh, and how we need to rethink the way we're managing them. So in that thing, just... of course. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And that, and that just keeps coming up, you know, that education is sort of the ongoing task that we need to, to find creative ways to do, you know, um, and find engaging ways to do. Yeah. So, yeah, I think that um, you did get a shout out from Libby Reuter in St. Louis. Um, hey, Libby. That, <laughs> Thanks for clarifying the values and stories of the river, you know, and Libby, like, for decades has been doing that, you know, creating stories. And, and for those of you that don't know Libby, um, you, you, you know, one way to get 
to get in touch with her is her website, watershedcairns.org. So that's watershed, C-A-I-R-N-S dot org. And Libby and her, um, her photographic partner, Josh, go out in the landscape and create really beautiful um, little temporary monuments in different places in the watersheds. So uh, definitely check that out when you talk about stories of our rivers. Um, thank you, Dean, so much for, uh, for, for sharing, you know, this work that you've been doing with us. Um, and, I, you know, and this is an ongoing conversation we all just keep needing to have. And so thank you. Thanks for that. Um, and thanks for the time and energy and, and thought that you put into this. We really appreciate it. Thanks. I'm, uh, I'm glad to have uh, a small part in this whole process. So <laughs> awesome. Um, well, have a good evening, everybody. Um, it's great to see you here online again. Um, you know, these recordings are going to be on YouTube for as long as YouTube's around, I guess. So um, uh, you can share them with friends that you think, you know, need to hear the messages that Dean says or any of our other presenters. So um, hopefully we'll be back here next month, second Tuesday, uh, Big Muddy Speakers 